the grasp of the whole hand that we were talking about just now. But unfortunately, his feelings drove him beyond the limits of fair judgment, so that he lumped all Jews together, good and bad, and called them all bad. The result was that many excellent Jews, patriotic Germans of good character, of great service to the community, found themselves treated as an inferior race and were deprived of certain privileges open to all other Germans. They could not be members of the forces, nor of the civil service, and in the social life various humiliations had to be borne through this racial prejudice. It is, yeah, he's talking about the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, by the way, and this is quite right. Um, those are also detailed in that Hitler Youth Manual of 1938 that I read. Um, if you're interested, you know, I think there's a PDF of that on the on the wiki on the archive. Um, but uh, I, I will mention that if a, a half German, half Jew could serve in the army, uh, and I've seen various examples of them. Um, but if you were full, uh, they, were, they were called Mischlings. Uh, if you were full, uh, uh, if you had both four grandparents, uh, all Jewish, uh, for example, uh, or th even three out of the four, you could not serve in the army. And, you, you know, there are many other things you couldn't do as well. Um, if it be called persecution to be ineligible for the army or the civil service, many of us would deem it delightful, a delightfully light form of persecution. The fact is that under the Nazis, a Jew simply as a Jew suffered no outrage, although here and there he was made to feel an inferior. It was only the Jew who incurred the suspicion of being disloyal, revolutionary or criminal, who brought on himself any real penalty. When I mean, I don't know about that. If you read those Nuremberg laws of 1935, there are a number of things that you couldn't do as, as a Jew in Germany. So um, he's kind of soft peddling this a little bit, I would say. But uh, anyway, let's carry on. Um, uh, when proved guilty, he met no mercy in the concentration camp. Too often he suffered from the suspicion alone. But once started, the whole business of the Jews in Germany increased to so in soreness, uh, in complexity and in intensity. And it must be said that Hitler's policy involved him in difficulties when he could not solve and earned him abuse when he could hardly afford it. A wave of pity for the Jews began to sweep over the other nations, a, a pity which, by the way, died as a rule in early death on closer acquaintance with many of the Jews who left Germany and a harder temper began to form against the Nazi tyrant but even so there was not one word heard of the Jewish question offering any fair ground for interference much less for war quote-unquote Chinese slavery after the Boer War or the quote-unquote enslavement of all India by Britain or the colour bar in the USA, were, to other nations, almost parallel cases. But however much we criticise and condemn, however much we were criticised and condemned for these, no other power dreamed of making them a ground for war. So too with the dreadful exposure of Belgian atrocities in the Congo. But we did not go to war with Belgium on that account. And uh, actually, he's making a good point here um, in however, he, you know, with his kind of milk toast Christian sentiments, um, blah, blah, blah. But uh, he is actually making a case here because as we've seen since World War II, all of these things he's talking about now um, have been made into parallels to Nazism, effectively in the, in the kind of woke system. And now our governments routinely try to go to war over these sorts of ideological grounds. You know, I mean, just think of the, think of the Ukraine one, for example. Um, so, I mean, he, uh, <coughs> he uh, is, is actually touching on something valid, although in my opinion, he's doing it in a, in, you know, he's not doing it for the right reasons, but he's highlighting something important here. Yeah. The same inability of most Britons to understand the violence of continental politics and the consequent need of stern measures to preserve state security 
made them loud in their denunciation of the 1934 oppression of Röhm and his followers. It is quite true that Hitler's quick and drastic way of ending this revolt before it had rightly began was not the British way. But when the conditions involved were not British, there is no reply possible to Hitler's own statement in defence of what he had done, that only so he could have prevented a fatal disruption and a rebellion in Germany with a great loss of life. What one who tries to be fair cannot stomach is the genial and tolerant way in which English critics dismissed as irrelevant and apparently excusable the massacres of millions of Russian uh, of Russians in the Russian Revolution for many years after, while they showed such righteous indignation at the death of a few hundred in the German one. The critics are also quite deaf and blind when it comes to our own methods of repression in India, for example, and in any other of our dominions where we held the whip hand. There is no calm trial then, but what an apologist for the government would would call stern an action. As this matter will be brought to fuller light in our later pages, we need not enlarge on it now. Suffice to say that though the Röhm purge was years old in 1938 and 1939, it was still a convenient brick to throw at Hitler when piling up charges of brutality against him. When we come to Spain and German partisan support of France uh, with Nazi volunteers well-equipped fighting on his side, we shall find that Italy, Germany and Russia were all equally intervening to the best of their abilities, although not in an official way. And British volunteers on the Spanish government side were not only numerous and Desperate in their zeal, when every comfort and convenience was gathered and sent out from Britain to help these British interventionists. The fact is that feeling between the democratic and communist system on the one side and the totalitarian ideal of Germany, Italy and now Spain on the other had by this time developed into such a conscious and well-defined antagonism that any obvious opportunity for displaying it could not be missed. And Spain, in this desperate civil war, added to the fire of political feud the fury of religious strife. It was not to be wondered at that nearly every big power permitted volunteers to go and fight on their own chosen side. And, as it turned out, alien influx proved of little importance in the long run to the general situation in Europe. The peninsula remained the peninsula politically, morally and religiously. It is absurd to quote Germany's volunteer force to Franco's side as her peculiar fault, or as a prelude to the wider warfare, especially when we consider the number of Britons serving on the communist side in the quote-unquote international brigade. We can at this stage, the summer of 1939, sum up therefore the main facts of the situation as this, that Hitler had built up a strong, virile, self-respecting nation, had proclaimed to the world that Germany desired peace, but demanded her rights and had armed herself to reassert them, that he had made himself protector of Czechoslovakia with the assent and even at the invitation of that republic, and that he regarded all internal action, whether secret or overt, against the German state as treason to be ruthlessly suppressed. As we have seen, that such opposition as we have seen that such opposition was not at all of the British democratic and peaceful kind, but employed poisonous propaganda and murderous agents, and could only be dealt with by strenuous and sometimes harsh methods. Nevertheless, by this time the worst period of trial was over, and the, and the concentration camps held ever fewer prisoners. They had been released in hundreds. The Jews had been deprived of the privilege of German citizenship, in order to safeguard against the precious grip, the previous grip that they had in so many regions of German life. And while they were encouraged to emigrate, they were not forced to, in contrast with the United States' practice of refusing permission to alien to enter her country at all. Oh, I wish they could return to that, I tell you, except on a small quota basis. The reader can judge for him or herself. He actually does not say herself, sorry. The reader can judge for himself 
Which is harder, to dismiss aliens who have proved a danger and an evil, or to exclude them for before ever they have proved to be anything of the sort? Based. I'll read that last line again. The reader can judge for himself which is harder, to dismiss aliens who have proved a danger and an evil, or to exclude them before they have ever proved to be anything of the sort. Well, naturally, we'd all like to do the latter, wouldn't we? Unfortunately, since this book was written, our leaders have done the exact opposite of that, unfortunately. <laughs>